Edgar Wortman, Netherlands, and I have a background in law. I'm a company lawyer, and I spend a lot of time in uh, helping companies finance, them, finance themselves and not become a bank. I will give you a perspective, my perspective, which is a legal perspective on the money system. And then you might say, well, it's boring because money is an economic thing. But you have to uh, know, remember, remind that uh, the money system resides in the legal system. So economists used to talk about the legal system, as of the, the money system, in stories and models, in ways they work. But the legal system is the system where it resides, where it is. So it, it lives, it exists in legal concepts. So to have a good understanding of the money system, we have to start with those concepts. So this is my contribution for you today. Uh, I think with this conference, we're at the stage of trying to understand this app. So I will contribute something from my legal perspective uh, here. And then I see within our current framework that we have three kinds, three forms of money. We have, of course, the money objects, cash, no, these are physical objects in the, in the current state, uh, state. And then we have uh, payment instruments. That's the legal term, the general legal term for what we uh, refer to as deposits in this conference. But other things can also be payment instruments. And you have money instruments. And then uh, normally in this conference, then this referred to shadow banking, for instance. And um, now there is a difference between the money objects and the, the, the second and the third thing, the, the instruments, I say. And what is that this difference, basically? Well, the money object embodies uh, uh, the power to pay. It is money. So there doesn't, there's nothing needed to back up it. It is, it embodies the currency. The instrument, on the other hand, is a contract. It's, you could say, it's derived from money objects, but it's, it's a promise of money, in fact. And you see that also in uh, the, the Bank of England, is very famous in presenting itself with this uh, picture that banking is about promises to pay. It's not about money because they don't have that much money, but they have a lot of promises of money. And in our system, there is a little bit of money objects, embodiment of the currency, and a whole lot of instruments. So these objects, the notes and the coins, are the currency. I call it inherent liquidity. You don't need a market. You don't need the value of anything. You don't need a counterparty. You don't. It's, it's ir irrelevant if any counterparty goes corrupt. There is in your object, there is purchasing power. So I call that inherent liquidity. You have it as cash at hand. Instruments, there is something that backs up the instrument. This promise, and you take a promise only if there is something to back up the promise, and that is in our system financial assets, basically. Then a money object is created in a legal way um, by the will, you could say, of the sovereign, of the, the one, the legitimate, legitimate power that can create it. It's a unilateral act of one person, and it doesn't need a counter to create it. The instrument are contracts. That means that there is at least two parties involved that have a, a, a consensus that they want to create something, something which is then called a payment instrument or a money market instrument in, uh, in, in, the, in the legal setup. But how can now a contract, which is just the meeting of two minds, you could say, how can that turn into money? Well, that is done by way of parity. That there is something that ensures that this contract, the value of this contract, exchanges one on one with the currency, with money objects. And actually, that is the core of what we can call the banking privilege. The special, it's the special thing around banks is that 
they can create something, can issue a debt title, make a contract, and then on those contracts, parity is applied. Or I, I call it here nominalism. Do I mean with nominalism what you have in inherent liquidity in a monetary object? If you have one euro, it has just a value of one euro. You cannot do anything about that. Well, when you have a contract, a contract normally has the value of what it backs it up. And sometimes that it's a lot, and sometimes it is nothing. So if, if you only have a contract without nominalism applied to it, then you have something that has changing value. It's not one-on-one. -on -one. But there is something that um, ensures that these instruments function as money, and that means that nominalism is applied, that parity is uh, yeah, uh, ensured. And that makes that the funding of a bank looks different than the funding of a normal business. A business can issue shares, it can issue bonds. The difference is that shares, do, you, you cannot reclaim the money from your share, and from a bond there is a point in time that you can reclaim it. So, we call it repayable funds in legal terms. And now, for banks, it's different. Think of a business, the funding of a bank. The bank has something called deposits, which, as we have learned from Michael Kumov this morning, they can create them themselves, so they can create their own funding. And maybe we can all do that, issue something and say, well, my funding. But what's the value? of this funding is the question. And who is that? Who, who can you convince to be a holder of such a title, to be a holder of a deposit? Well, that does the institutional order. You could say that's the lawmaker combined with the central bank. They do all kinds of things that block market processes around deposits. We are not asked to, uh, to look at what is this kind of debt title, what is it worth? because otherwise it would not function as money. Then we would be in the same situation as we were during the, the, the free banking time in the, in the United States, where everybody could issue, every bank could issue banknotes. And a banknote was then a promissory note. It was a claim on a bank. And you had almost bankrupt banks, and you had very solid banks. And a claim on a bankrupt bank was not uh, worth the value that was on the note from that bank. So you could have notes with a dollar on it, but the note from bank A could have $10 on it, but because nominalism was not applied, its value could be five cents. And if you had bank B with $10 on it, but it was a solid bank, then the value of it was, for instance, $9, because it was not cash at hand at that time, banknote, but it was a claim on the assets of the bank. But the institutional order created something to give that certain claims on certain institution, so these instruments, which are claims on financial institutions, financial entities, financial setups, that market processes are blocked, that we are not asking ourselves what's the real value. Uh, so that also, by way of prudential oversight, they say, well, the government has looked at uh, these institutions, so you, public, the market, don't look at it anymore. They tell you it's safe, so you have to take it for safe. And you take uh, the deposit of one as a value for one, so you apply nominalism, because we want you to do that. And to keep this up, because this cannot work, in fact, because it's against nature, it's against uh, the laws of the markets. It's just, uh, 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 yeah, uh, trying to create something which is not there. Um, you get a system in which you, by state aid, uphold the financial system that's, um, that does not have the content that we pretend that it has. And why do we have this setup? Well, we can explain it because it had its value in the past. And that is, we started somewhere in the times of metallism that gold and silver, that was money. And gold and silver had a fixed amount, you could say. 
then I do not look at the mining then, but in fact, um, you want to build flexibility, monetary flexibility on top of a rather fixed amount of metal. And it was good to have banking that sets a layer upon gold and silver, and then you can, you can create money than you have in the form of gold and silver. Well, that is already outdated because we left metallism after the Second World War. But then another reason remained why it was to have a system that applies nominalism to claims on financial institutions. And that is because of its provided payment over distance. When I want to pay from Amsterdam to Frankfurt and I have to do that in physical objects, then I have to make sure that I can transport, uh, transport a physical object from Amsterdam to Frankfurt. And that's a burden, that's a risk, and you want to avoid that. So then it's good to work with a network of agents that uh, do not transport physical objects, but have a way of set off credit claims. And then you can pay by way of um, handing over information. So it was an easy way in the times of stagecoaches and, 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 uh, and analog telephone to get a system that enables payment over distance, not based on money objects, but based on derivatives from that instruments. And then the government had good reason to say, we back this because it is so important to the economy that, um, well, we, we, we do whatever it takes to support this system. But this is now outdated. For metallism, it was outdated long ago. And when the internet came, it was outdated also for this, this reason, uh, for, for the payment over distance. Because now we can create intangible money objects. We can create what we are calling now uh, something like digital cash, something which is intangible, something that, which could be transferred like information. You don't have to carry anything, which embodies the currency. So it's not a claim on anything. It's not a, uh, a claim on assets. It's not a claim on a counterparty, but it's money in itself. And when the euro was established, Europe could have chosen, because the internet was already there, to base its system on that. But it didn't make that decision. It went on in its own outdated system in which financial institutions are artificially supported by the state so that the debt titles they issue, some debt titles they issue, can be used as money. And it brings a lot of problems with it because these are debt titles. So this is debt money, this can burn society with debt and debt risk, which puts a limit to the money supply because at a certain point, the risk of creating more money is a stalls, uh, is, is, a, is limiting the engine for the economy. You cannot expand endlessly in such a debt money system. So it has reached limit anyway. But uh, fundamentally, it was not needed anymore to build a money system which is directly connected to bank balance sheets and the assets banks have. Um, so what we could propose, uh, one of the themes I heard today was that uh, cash is disappearing. But I think what we should propose is not that cash would disappear, but that we would uh, transition to a cash only money system. A money system that's only based on money objects, only based on physical and non-physical, so digital things, objects, which embody the currency. And this is something that could then be centrally controlled. And then we would transition from a debt-based system, debt-based, that that that's the same as the instruments, all those, the, the debt titles issued that are used as money. We transition from a debt-based to a cash-only system, in the physical and in the digital form. And then you will see that you don't need backing of money anymore. You don't need bank assets hoarded on a balance sheet. You don't need assets packaged as collateral to back up money market instruments. You just have money. And you, even if you like to back it, 
for instance, when we had a banknote which was exchangeable for silver, in the Netherlands we had that until 1984, uh, then this is a power which uh, puts your banknote at risk because when there's exchangeability with silver, uh, the question is, is there enough covering in silver to, uh, to, to back up this note? Well, at, at a certain point in the Netherlands in 1984, exchangeability was discontinued. It was just a note. And that improved the status of the note. Because now the purchasing power that was not, uh, there was no interference anymore with the question, is there enough silver in the vaults of the central bank? The only question is, will people take it? Will people take the note of, of one guilder? In that time, we had guilders uh, uh, for a uh, uh, debt payment of one guilder. And they did. And there, there was the, 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 the money object and is not in any question anymore about its value. The instruments do have the problem that there is always the question, is the backing which we have as a fundamental underlying thing, is it enough? And we learn time and time again, that there's always something to say about this backing, so it's better to decouple this. So, um, there was, it's also talking about the central bank digital currency. Um, that, of course, is um, a step in the direction of getting digital monetary objects. But the way it's in the, in the working papers now, the CBDC is still a claim on the central bank. It's always talking about uh, uh, give people access to the central bank balance sheet, which means that they have a claim on the assets of the central bank. What you will have when um, the system transitions to central bank digital, as it is now in the papers, you will get a giant central bank because money flows to the central bank. And at the same time, when money flows out of commercial banks to the central banks, the commercial banks have to, in one way or the other, lend from the central bank and put collateral in the central bank. So the central bank will grow and grow and grow. And because this is something with top-down forced banks, you have a good chance that the central bank will not get the best assets out of the existing banking system. So. CBDC as such might end up as creating a giant bad central bank, which is not very good to back up your currency. So doing CBDC only, I think, is not a good idea because that's concentrating risk in one bank. But if you do it with a view to decouple the currency from underlying assets, so to go to a system in which you have um, intangible liquid assets, money objects, which have nothing to do anymore with assets hoarded on any bank balance sheet. Well, then you, you make your own currency safer. And I have it put here as number two. I call this decoupling of the currency. So first you create this giant central bad bank. But then at, uh, when, when, when this is finished, you say, well, the currency is set apart. This is now intangible liquid object. object. This is, these are money objects, digital money objects. And all those assets that we have now, or that on this balance sheet, can be used to deleverage the current money system. Now, I made a story uh, about this. I put that on the, on the website of the International Movement for Money Reform. So if you know that, you can go to that uh, website. It's International Money Reform. Mm -hmm. And um, there I describe in a story how this uh, deleveraging of the system uh, would work by handing out the citizen's dividend. That's a word that is developed in the monetary reform movement for um, how to deleverage the system. One aspect of transitioning to a digital money system. This conference is also about blockchain. Uh, what is, from my perspective, the of blockchain? That is that it promises 
that real essence will be much more become much more liquid so that there might come um, next to money which is the official uh, unit of value the currency that real assets for instance shell can uh, trade it much easier easier by way of tokenizing it and handing it over so next to the system that's money money based or uh, the money system you can have more liquidity by way of transferring um, uh, uh, real value and if then you can store when you receive this you can store shares and bonds uh, in a very liquid way so you can transfer them uh, almost as easy as you could uh, transfer uh, money and next to that you have the cash only money system which is totally different in, in character this is not contract based anymore it's not linked to underlying assets in the more anymore and it can also be managed to uh, target zero inflation so that it always maintains the same value and if you do that you have to manage uh, the hoarding of the kind of money because if you uh, can uh, let it uh, flow into the system endlessly and it hoards at certain places then the hoardings can be a danger to your inflation position so um, today we heard uh, the lady from the, the ECB say well we need assets on our balance sheet to to manage the value of the euro because we need to be able to sell uh, assets to shrink the money supply and if we don't have that we need something else for instance taxes and I think we should open to the idea be open to the idea that this is what the monetary authority actually should do not distort money uh, uh, markets by uh, buying uh, lots of assets on, on markets uh, at, at, at the wrong moment and selling them at the wrong moment but uh, be not active at, at markets no open market operations but just stick to a cash only money system and without an inflation target go to a, a zero inflation target want to keep the money stable the instruments is that you will tax uh, money away where it amasses, uh, amasses too much and then you will see that the idea that money should be a store of value becomes questionable because money provides inherent liquidity as I told and like everybody to have sufficient liquidity buffers but not beyond that so money then is liquidity but not a store of value that you can amass endlessly so you get also in that respect different concepts of money um, I think that I will I do a recap of what I have said so far so I made the distinction with objects and the payment instruments and the money market instruments money objects here is cash and the payment instruments and the money market instruments are the the, the deposits and the MMFs and repos and then the cash that has inherent liquidity it is the currency it is uh, it doesn't need anything backing it deposits and the money market funds they need underlying value for the deposits it is the, the assets on the bank balance sheet and for the money market instruments it's collateral the difference between uh, the payment so that the banking thing and the shadow banking thing is that the banking uh, in, in deposits get a claim on the whole uh, 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 bunch of assets of a bank whereas in in shadow banking you have a special claim on a on a singled out package of underlying value 
but the principle is the same. You have a claim on something which is backed by assets, and with cash, you don't have a claim. It's a non-recourse instrument. Cash is the nominal thing. It's one-on-one -on -one by name. And for the instruments, we create by an institutional setup, you could say, by the central bank. So we apply nominalism to instrument, to contract. And I think the key to monetary reform is that we, on the one hand, go to a digital cash system. So we have the, the nominalism by nature thing, also on an intangible form of cash, digital cash, and that we abandon parity on these instruments, on the contract, apply market forces to, to contracts. We give them, let them be uh, tr uh, treated according to fair value, just like securities are treated. That will make financial law much more simpler because currently financial law is very because we have to deal with these special forms which are somewhere in between, which are called the, the payment instruments and the money market instruments. And if we just say, well, we shouldn't have them anyway because we don't need them anymore because we have digital cash, we can just treat them as if they are bonds or shares. And that would take away all the privileges that banks have. The financial institution would not be nothing special anymore. And it would not have a special position in funding its business. It would be just as normal as business. So the takeaway here is, yes, I'm very much in favor of creating digital cash in the form that it's not a claim on anything or anyone. But that's a money object which inherently, uh, it, it, which is pur purchasing power in itself, that we should base the system entirely on real money. So the object, money, the currency. And that's what we now have in our money system, which is in fact a credit system in which we believe in all those instruments, um, that they are treated like regular uh, bonds like regular shares, uh, which means that when somebody issues it, that there is not a central bank that backs up to say, well, you take it, you take this, this debt instrument that issued because we apply parity, so you know that one count is one value. No, this institutional element is put away, but that when someone issues a debt title to get funding, for its business, it has to explain what it wants to do, and what it will do, the funding, and what you will get back. And there's no institutional order that promises anything which makes you be willing to uh, be the holder of those instruments. 